Hello, this podcast is recorded on Gadigal country and we pay our respects to the First Nations custodians of the land, both here and also wherever you're listening from. Happy New Year! Hello, I have shoes on. This is a recent first. <laughs> yeah, it's Happy quite, quite, un- to you. quite uncomfortable, isn't it, getting back into the uh, work appropriate? Right, yeah. and also yeah. a big apology to uh, everybody who's been sort of going, hang on a minute, why aren't you back yet? And the fault is mine. I've had a dodgy voice, um, which I've been working on by saying no to things, <laughs> not going out, <laughs> staying in, resting it Excellent. and doing some obscure vocal exercises at the hands of many, many chatters who turn out to be speech people. And I know chatters will find this hard to believe, but I've been enjoying my new role as NARC in chief. Oh. Keeping an eye on her, making sure that she's, you know, doing her exercises every day, that she's not talking too much, that she's eating appropriately. So pretty much I'm like this kind of, you know, it's like having kind of one of those people from the Americans with you all the time, studying every single thing you do and then just on your case. I was actually just about to say you are the person in a white lab coat to my greyhound. (laughs) (laughs) You know I don't pull out the greyhound analogy very often. You do like to though (laughs) occasionally, don't you? But have you noticed that, I don't know if my voice sounds different to you, it sounds a bit different to me because... It does sound different. One thing that I have learned to do in the last couple of months is talk using my diaphragm because it turns out all my voice problems are like related to the fact that For my whole life, I thought that this was the right way to breathe, (sighs) like as in shallow and in your chest. And for those joining us orally, (laughs) my shoulders are going up and down. And I also do just a ridiculous amount of gesticulation and kind of facial stuff with all of these chest and neck and face muscles and turns out... Turns I've been doing it wrong. You've worn them all out. So now (laughs) I'm wandering around... Sunny like Kate Blanchett. Hilariously, I've been doing some singing lessons for oh, here the we go. Adelaide Cabaret Festival this year where we're doing a Chat 10 show and I'll be doing, well, if I can get it together, I'll be doing a number with our friend Virginia Gay, who's the artistic director. My favourite thing about this <laughs> is that if I were asked to do that, I mean, and yes, I'll be there with you, but I'm not <laughs> doing any singing, but if I were... I would just go do a few sort of trills in the shower the day before. No, no, you've gone... Full Leonardo DiCaprio, (laughs) you've moved to the wilderness. (laughs) Funnily enough, the exercises that I do for that are not dissimilar to the ones that you do because it's all about loosening up all of your muscles around your jaw and your face. So I'm constantly annoying my children by going around and blowing a straw into (gasps) glasses of water, by doing and all of this kind of stuff and, yeah, so. I'm constantly travelling with a straw now (laughs) and um, going... And then, yes. oh, and oh, you'll, mm. You will be able to sing with Virginia Gay. No, I will not. <laughs> but I will be able to heckle very mellifluously and that will please me. Now, because the this is the first podcast of the year, the first two pods of every year, we do Crab Summer of Culture mm. and Sales as Summer of Culture and we talk about what we've consumed over the Christmas New Year break, which means we've always got a ton of stuff to try to get through. So yes, it does. we're going to kick off. Episode one is going to be Crab's Summer of Culture. So hit me, babe. Well, because I've been hiding at home and just doing nothing except breathing through my diaphragm, I have actually consumed a lot of content. And I want to tell you where I started, like the second that I knocked off, um, because it'll make you so very happy. I read The Palace Papers by Tina Brown. My Christmas reading last year. Right. And because I felt, you know, I mean, I was sort of stressed and stuff and I was... I didn't feel like tangling with anything sort of political nonfiction. I sort of didn't feel like fiction. And then I thought, hang on a minute. You told me that that was an absolute racy read. And so I really enjoyed it. And it's a good holiday read, right? Yeah, yeah. And it hits that spot of being well informed. It's not arch in the way that lots of people who cover and write about the royal family do um, and it's not too deferential and it's really, really intelligent. You know, I just, I really, I loved every minute of it and it didn't take me long to read and I actually sort of felt I learnt some stuff. I mean, I don't ever feel absolutely obsessed with knowing everything about the royal family but it is, um, you know, a, uh, a really good account by a 
good journalists who can also write well. As I said, I think at the time, um, I felt like, oh, I just don't want to know another word about Kate Middleton or Meghan Markle and yeah. actually held my interest remarkably. And it's because Tina Brown, because she's kind of part of, you know, the British elite and has been for decades, she can just situate everything in great context and brings lots of, you know, just great colour to it. So, and, and also just absolutely unimpeachable contacts, you know. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's sort of watching those those flexes that she occasionally does, you know, as my uh, husband Harold Evans once said. Like, <laughs> yes, of course. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, but it kind of brings me to another book that I massively enjoyed and read only a, a week or two ago on the advice of my old friend and uh, cookbook co-author Wendy Sharp who was visiting over the summer. She's been trying to get me to write, uh, read this book called Chums for ages and because I was you know, sitting next to her, I downloaded it and said, I am going to read it. And then I absolutely smashed through it. So oh. Chums is a book by a guy called Simon Cooper. And he is an Oxford educated guy who turned into a journalist. Whereas a bunch of people from his generation were Oxford educated guys who went into politics and then broke Britain. So this is a book about how Oxford is overrepresented in the ranks of politicians in the UK um, through the generations, but what the consequences of that has been in this generation. And he, I mean, obviously, you know, Boris Johnson, um, uh, Cam uh, David Cameron and co weren't the first prime ministers to be Oxford educated, but his theory is that they were the first generation of Oxford educated political leaders who did not have to go through a war. And, ah. and he says that the way that Oxford taught students back when they were there was his argument is that it was obviously a highly elitist place. If you'd been to Eton already, you had a massive head start for getting in because the entrance interview, which is for Oxford um, you do it with a, an existing tutor who, if they recognise your school or if they um, recognise your class and connections back then, you had a better chance of getting in, even if you were a bit thick. And he then says the other thing about Oxford is that um, people looked, you were looked down upon if you studied science or maths. It was all about um politics, economy and philosophy and PPE. Yeah, PPE. And he said that it was you were also looked down on for working too hard. Oh. So the people who were most admired and respected, he says, were the people who could drink all day and night, party on, then like then study like crazy for a week and then pass. Or the Bill Clinton model when he was there as a road scholar, which was do absolutely nothing and then just write the paper the night before it was due off the top of your head and then it's the most brilliant paper the lecturer has ever seen. Right. And at the Oxford Union, which is the very famous debating society, which, you know, um, like all of these politicians have sort of come through, there was a premium placed on a person who could make an argument without really deploying any facts whatsoever. And this guy says, well, look, it was all about sort of ad hominem attacks. Oh, and, how fascinating. And he said that the American students really struggled because they thought that debating was, you know, applying facts and putting together an argument and they'd regularly just get completely shredded and humiliated by people like Boris Johnson who had no idea what he was talking about but could make it sound funny. And actually yeah. being funny and cutting was the main advantage. Oh, in that, that sounds great. Right? And so his argument is that this generation spawned a bunch of blokes who went into politics thinking they were amazing, knowing everybody else, but not actually having much of an interest in how stuff actually works, just how to use rhetoric to win an argument. And it's sort of chilling as you read this book to, to see how closely that explains not only Brexit mm. um, but also what happened in the UK um, during COVID. It's just it's absolutely fascinating. And there's um, Bill Clinton is quoted in it just actually to your point about, um, you know, the Americans being there, um, he said that when he was at Oxford, 
he and the other American um, undergraduates spent most of their time worrying about whether they were going to get called up to Vietnam. Oh, so yeah. they were absolutely occupied with this idea of the reality of war. Oh. But, you know, they, they, he said his English um, colleagues just were like, didn't really get it. What a fascinating thesis mm. and probably could only have been come up with by someone who was kind of there and observed all of that firsthand. Yeah, and he, and he says that um, going back, back and looking at all the predecessors um, in politics and leadership who had come from a stint serving in the military, he said that they had an understanding of how decisions that leaders make have enormous consequences for um other people because, he said, actually serving in the army was the most egalitarian experience that any of these young men had ever had because right. they'd grown up um, without really any true understanding of, um, you know, what working class life was like or yeah. even looked like. And he even talks about the importance of environment and, you know, they think that the, you know, the real England is the rolling green fields and, the, you know, the horse riding and the whatever, but only a tiny fragment of English um, population actually lives like that or in houses like that or with lovely views like that. Yeah, it's interesting. Speaking of which, it reminds me of something I know you've seen and I also watched over summer um, that I'm really keen to talk about, which is <laughs> Saltburn. Ah! Excellent. It's been very popular, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Now, okay, did you like it? Uh, well, weirdly enough, I watched it after I read, I, I, after reading the Chums book, he talks about the fact that um, that generation of um, political leaders and debaters were all very influenced by Brideshead Revisited, the series that took the world by storm oh. when they were at college. So they all thought, and he's this incredible line where he says, and sorry, I'll move back to where we'd got to. He said that Brides Had Revisited was almost like a defense of toffs, like it made them feel okay about being posh again. Right. Because sort of the, you know, 60s and 70s had all been about being ashamed of being posh. And then somehow Brides Had Revisited with its sort of, you know, gloriousness and kind of complexity and intellectual life actually made it cool to be posh again. Look, I feel like I couldn't possibly comment about that <laughs> given that Brideshead Revisited read aloud by Jeremy Irons <gasps> is my help me fall asleep oh, book. Thank and, God. And actually, just to give you a <laughs> sense of what he sounds like. Dance in Belgrave Square. Mm-hmm. Just come from one, said Mark I can't tell you how heavenly that is to fall asleep to. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so anyway, I then went back and watched Bride's Head Revisited again and because there's a there's a remastered version um and it's like it's great. It's fascinating. And so when I came to watch Saltburn um on the recommendation recommendation of my daughter, <laughs> she paused then because I've kept calling it salt bush yeah. all before. <laughs> So I've actually got Nutbush City Limits going through one of my brain like things at the moment. So yeah, absolutely managed to. We'll uh, be doing the salt bush at the end of this recording. <laughs> Steeple chase fence. Uh, anyway, so this story, Salt Bush, is about um, a kid who Hang turns on salt burn. burn. <laughs> Salt burn, sorry, salt burn. It's on. It's on Netflix. We should back up. Salt burn on Netflix. It's a, I'd call it a black comedy gothic horror yeah. kind of vibe. It's about a guy who's a kind of scholarship boy at Oxford, um, or is it Cambridge? One of those. Remember. Um, and he kind of becomes friends with the dude who is the man on campus, who's this very wealthy kid who everyone seems to incredibly like. handsome, yeah, charismatic, charming, but a nice guy, sexually well. ambiguous, yeah, um, and sort of takes pity on this guy who's very smart and nervous and who starts to big up the tales of his troubled childhood, uh, which causes problems further down the track. Anyway, and he's invited to stay with the family for a summer or something and turns up At and, of the course, house. it's a giant pile. The house which is called Salt Bush Slash Burn. <laughs> And, of course, it's got, you know, mazes and ponies and, you know, yep. Richard E. Grant is the dad, which is fantastic. He was great. And actually yeah. Rosamund Pike as the mother was, I thought, Ooh, fantastic. Terrific. So it's like 
good cast. There's good eye candy. Yeah. The parlour scene with the family, when the whole family would be together, including the woman who was visiting, who yeah. was the mother's friend, I found those scenes really funny. Yes, I loved those too. Um, and then, wouldn't you know, um, he then gets sort of obsessed with the family and very ingrained and then some bad things happen. <laughs> and anyway, it's, you know, it's quite a, it's a bit chilling at, at times. It is. Um, there's a few creepy, um, there's, there's a scene that people have been talking about a lot that you'll know as soon as you're watching it. What we're talking about involves a bathtub. Yes. <laughs> I didn't, I, I felt like it fit. I didn't feel like it was gratuitous. It fit with the overall vibe of the thing, which was just creepy. You know, like there's there's a kind of genre, I suppose, which is rich people where everything's perfect. There's a creepiness <clears throat> underneath. It's, it's that genre. Yeah. Look, my view of it, my criticism of it would be just your standard look into the mirror and take something off. <laughs> like there's just, there's a, like, there's a few kind of too many, like everybody has got a grim secret and you get sort of grimly marched through them one by <laughs> one to the point where you're like, okay, so we haven't found out the mum's secret. Oh, that, here we go. Yep. And yeah. so there's a bit of, it's a bit kind of like, come on, you didn't have to put that much peanut butter on the toast. Yeah, But right. the ending I didn't find very convincing. I mean, it's certainly like, wow, but I also, I don't know, it just... I think when you've got an, a cast of that calibre and a setting of that kind of richness, um, I think, come on, you could you could be, you could try a bit less and be a bit better at it. So yeah, plot wise. Yeah, fair um, enough. But yeah. the other thing that I would give it ten out of ten for is the use of. Uh, murder on the dance floor as the final track. <laughs> it's just so out of yeah, nowhere, that is great. and I just went. Well, that's weird and also great. Yeah, I liked the ending yep. a lot. I, mm. I thought it worked really well. Yeah, that that was a kind of a happy couple of hours spent. Well, I don't know if happy is the right words, but yeah. certainly held my interest. Yeah, and I just, you know, it was easy to watch and, you know, oh, it's not sort of like every other movie um, and it's not a Marvel movie, so I yeah, enjoyed right. it. Um, also, it really reminded me that I haven't read one of my all-time favourite books, uh, which is called Watching the English by Kate Fox. I've oh, yeah. talked to you about this before. She's an anthropologist and she's written a book about her own people <laughs> and it's funny and weird and goes into all of that crazy stuff that you kind of see periodically in The Crown. You're like, well, how is it that the posh people can dress really shabbily? Like, like <laughs> yeah. how does that, you know, and it goes into absolute detail about like the kinds of flowers that posh people grow in their gardens and the kinds of, like you can tell from people's gardens, from what they call dinner is, uh, from what they, you know. Well, they don't call it tea. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, and apparently there is a new edition out of that book. Oh. So I am going to absolutely run, don't walk to that. Now, while we're still on the English, um, I read a book by a woman that we met at the Ubud Writers Festival called Louise Doughty. She was so fun. Far out she was good. She was great fun, yeah. Really she funny. Apple Tree Yard, yes. which was very, very popular. You might have read that um, and it was that was turned into a TV show. We bumped into her at a pool and we started did. talking and then she said her name and I went, oh, Ow. I know who you are. Ow. <laughs> and, wow, great raconteur, very funny, very down to earth. I just would cheerily have dinner with her any night. I really liked her. So when I saw she had a new book out, I went, oh, I'll I'll grab that. It's called A Bird in Winter. And the other thing I like about her is like she writes genuinely twisty sort of like gripping stories that are well written. Like they – and they're original. They're not kind of like, oh, God, now the maid is going to look through the window and see her. Yep, all right. <laughs> um, you know, it's not sort of full the woman in the train on the window – kind of cookie cutter and this one is about a woman who's a spy and her dad was a spy and she is running away she's she leaves her office and she gets a lift down and she's counting the seconds that she has to get clear because something's just happened in this meeting with her big boss and you don't know what it is and she immediately disappears so Relevant to our ongoing discussion about how easy it is to disappear oh, yeah. completely because uh, it's set in the modern day, this book will answer it. Like, oh, so, great. Yeah, okay. to some extent. And I like it because she's kind of like she's a 
mysterious character, but she's really smart and incredibly resourceful. And you find out more and more about her and a relationship that she's had with her, her great friend, which is has, was severed for some reason. And you find that out. Anyway, I... It, it didn't take me long to read because I couldn't put it down. Uh-huh. And if you are looking for one of those well-written, original, has a great female character, lead character that's not sort of um, laboured in any way, just really interesting. So I, another yeah. good holiday yeah, read and by it's the spying. sounds. It's spying love sales. Spying. Yeah. Love so spying. I think you'll love it. Um, I'm just going through the books really um, and, look, I've read a few more than I'm going to mention because there's millions of them and also – plenty of time um, mm. because we are, um, you know, going to make more podcasts. But um, I would particularly recommend a book that I read by Jennifer Thurgate called Green Dot. Uh-huh. And it is about this um, woman that works in a gallery, very cool gallery in New York. I think Jennifer Thurgate is Australian, so half it's set in Australia. And she runs her own independent gallery and she's sort of basically – shags blokes occasionally if she feels she needs to she occasionally shags one of her artists and then she meets and kind of falls in love with this Australian kind of handsome young man who works for one of the big art auction houses and he's coming over for some research mission they meet they're very different um and then something happens to her and her gallery. It's a sort of a cancel culture sort of situation that she then has to deal with. And it's just a, like it's a really smart, I mean, it's a really pacey um, plot. I I thought it was well structured and it also has a bit of a glance at, you know, how the art world deals with, oh, yeah. you know, assholes who make art and also assholes who make art that is itself you know problematic what does problematic mean what do you do about it particularly if you're a gallery owner and you need to make money yeah yeah oh that's that's terrific yeah very good yeah um can I ask you about two things I know you've seen that Mm. I haven't seen and I really want to know if I should one is Nyad Nyad okay I have watched it have you? No, that's oh. why I want to know. Like. So, yeah, like, and and I came to it. How did I come to it? I'm reading uh, a book that is not published yet um, by Kathy Lett and it's a very, very funny book about um, older women um, getting revenge for being professionally kind of slighted. Right. Um, I'll talk about it when, when it's out. It's called The Revenge Club. But it. I was thinking about, you know, older women, you know, coming back and, you know, proving – themselves and all this stuff and I thought I'll I'll watch Nyad because Nyad has two of my favourite actresses of all time in it, Annette Bening and Jodie Foster Um, and it is the story which is I think a true story, quickly. quickly It is, yeah. yeah. Um, Of this woman called Diane Nyad who um, resolved to be the first woman or person I think even to swim from Cuba to Florida which is a horrendously difficult swim, even if you're very good at swimming. And she got all this, she raised all this money and did this huge, you know, um, and well-publicised swim as a much younger woman and failed and then kind of, you know, retired and knocks around playing pool with Jodie Foster, who's also a retired sports coach coach from a completely different discipline. They're just friends. Yeah, they're they? just friends. Right. So they just play pool and, you know, hang around. And they're in their, I guess, 60s by this stage. And then Nyad decides she's going to have another go at it. And so this story is the story of their attempts to raise money and undertake this completely ridiculous swim. And I just, the ability to watch two profoundly talented actors who have not insisted on being fully made up, fully done and fully clipped, snipped and trimmed for the purposes of filming is so rare. Yeah. And you really, I mean, it's a great story. It's an incredible story. But also just the pleasure of watching these two women be incredibly good at their jobs 
um, is, yeah, rare and fabulous. I, I, I don't know if I would say this just because, you know, this is the direction I'm trending in, but I do find it as I'm getting older, more and more pleasurable to look at properly aged faces on women. Like yeah. I feel like I love, I think Jodie Foster looks amazing. I think Annette Benning looks yeah. amazing. And what makes them look amazing to me is their authentic face. Yeah. Emma Thompson, I feel like, looks better than she's ever looked. Emma like, Thompson's ridiculous. Yeah. They, they just look I don't know. I, I think it is, as I say, because they still look human and so they have the full range of expression on their face. So yeah. I, it, I find that really appealing. I think one of the other reasons is I saw just by way of, I won't talk about it too much, I went to see Mean Girls, the musical, which is, so oh. Tina Fey wrote Mean Girls, great movie. She stars in it um, and um, that fabulous woman whose name I can never remember, but I will as soon as. Uh, anyway, keep going, Annabelle. It will pop up. It was then made into a musical, like a stage musical, and then this remake is the film that they made of the musical that they made of the film. So, oh wow! So, so it's back songs, right? engineered, right? Yeah, and the songs are great. Like it's, I think they've sort of they've made it a bit less edgy. A lot of the sort of stuff that made it kind of really blackly funny and kind of um, slightly, you know, edgy was has been taken out of it. Um, Tina Fey's in it again, same role, which is awesome. But Lindsay Lohan, who plays the principal role in the original, actually shows up at the very end where um, there's a a maths quiz and she's like the moderator of the maths quiz (laughs) and I did not recognise her. Wow. So my daughter said, oh, my God, it's Lindsay Lohan. I'm like, is it? And... She looks, I mean, she looks great. She looks like, you know, you'd meet her and think there is a good-looking woman. But all the little things about Lindsay Lohan's face that made it so remarkable and full of character yeah. are sort of gone. Like you oh. wouldn't you wouldn't recognise her in the street. So she's not full freckle face like she used to be. She looks like a really sort of well-preserved, good-looking New York, right. you know, real estate agent or something. Like, I mean, she's... Yeah, but there's something I can't even vote. I can't even understand. I can't really explain what made Lindsay Lohan's face so interesting to look at mm. as you know a child actor and as a, as a teenager. But like, it's sort of not there anymore. And I feel a bit like that sometimes when I look at Portia de Rossi, who you know had the most entrancing face, but that now looks a lot more, just a lot more like other beautiful blonde women. Anyway, yeah. and so that makes me feel sad sometimes. And, I, you know, people can do with their bodies whatever they want. But I do um, think that sometimes I feel a bit anxious when I see actors that have had a heap of work done because I feel like it's a bit of a TikTok thing where you get a bit done and then you get more done because you're still trying to look like you're 30, which is sort of sustainable at 40 and then a bit sustainable at 50. And then by the time, you know, you're quite a bit older, it it can't keep going. So at some point they're going to look yeah. frightening. And I always get a sense when I'm watching of like, how long will it be until you look frightening? <laughs> and I think also I feel bad for them be- and, you know, don't want to be judgy because – I mean, that industry is so brutal. They're so judged on what they look like. It's oh, just awful. Yeah, look, it must feel like, I mean, it must be an, in, an incredibly stressful thing to think. I mean, nobody wants to have their face cut off and reapplied or whatever. But if you, you know, if you know that you aren't necessarily going to be in the band of truly immortal female actors who will still get work because of their you know, intense ability. Because they're Jodie Foster or whatever. Yeah. yeah, or maybe because of that culture congratulating women on their beauty so consistently and comprehensively, you feel like y- you can't lose this thing that people have always, you know, yeah, praised well, you for. because it's your prime currency. Yeah. So, yeah. so anyway, I mean, however, I, yeah, I, I, I loved that film. I really... Um, got into it. Another film that I saw was Wonka over the holidays. Yeah, now this, the, I'm glad you raised it because yeah. that was the other one I wanted to know. I've heard really good things about it. It's terrific. Yeah. Yeah, it's really good. Um, and, you know, when you see a film that's a remake of it, like you've, 
there's been a bunch of attempts at it. Um, they've done enough different stuff. Um, I mean, it's sort of like the um, it's the backstory of Willy Wonka, like what happened, how did he, how he became this sort of god of chocolate. And Timothy Chalamet is the it plays Wonka and is just perfection in it. You know, great dancer, sings well, good looking. And there's a funny cast, you know, uh, it's just there's jokes, there's little sort of British twinges of humour, the sets are incredible. I just really enjoyed it. I um, have been thoroughly enjoying Instagram keeps bowling me up <laughs> publicity because it knows that I love Hugh Grant, so it yeah. keeps bowling me up Hugh Grant on the publicity circuit. Oh, my gosh, let's play um, that. Oh, man, he's just so <laughs> – somebody was asking him about accepting the role and he's like, well, that's all I really ever get – Offered these days, I'm in the pervert phase of my career. <laughs> Freaks, perverts, and apparently umpa lumpers. <laughs> and he, look, he really. So I'm gonna fan myself. These lights are like woo, <laughs> melting. Um, yeah. So I really, for a man who spent probably the most prosperous chunk of his career being the same person, he has had a like. Terrific preparedness oh, to amazing. go off and do something. The thing you know. that's so shocking to me is that such a handsome man has ended up being such a great character actor. He is yep. like, I mean, I'm sure I've said this on this pod before, but Paddington 2, if you haven't seen it, <laughs> Hugh Grant is side splittingly funny. He is so yeah. funny. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the gentleman, I also thought he oh, was yeah. just. Absolutely Terrific. hilarious. So um, now I know I shouldn't be taking up your time, which you're um, almost out of. Oh, yeah, right. I was waiting when that um, reminder would come. Yeah, the thing I'd say about Hugh Grant is for somebody who's always been very handsome and always a leading man, he really captures the sense of slight insecurity of an Oompa Loompa who is shorter than the other Oompa Loompas and also <laughs> a bit like – the sense of wounded pride and vulnerability that he projects is terrific. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is not a recent film but we've been doing this thing with the kids where um, Jeremy sort of snuffles out some, you know, movie that he thinks that they should see and we sit around and, you know, absorb it together. We've had a few hits and a few misses but one that we saw that I just really loved and had not caught at the time it came out, which is like getting on for 10 years ago, is called The Peanut Butter Falcon. I've heard of that, but yeah. I never saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, it's about um, a young man who lives in a, um old folks' home. It's because he's like probably in his mid-20s, but he has Down syndrome and it has been decreed somehow because he doesn't have any family that this is where he needs to be cared for. So he's in there with a bunch of oldies and he's constantly – trying to break out so there's these sequences of him like in his schemes there's this great one where he um hands his co-conspirator an elderly lady um a piece of paper um saying that he's going to offer her his spare custard tart and she has to pretend to have a coughing fit and choke on it which she does creating a diversion allowing <laughs> him to bolt and eventually he does bolt and he runs into the actor's um name is zach Gottsagen. and he's absolutely fabulous actor this is the young man when he escapes he's in the nude pretty much he's wearing a big pair of wire fronts and he runs into a fisherman who's on the run from the angry other fisherman that he's just stolen stuff from and they somehow kind of end up on the road together it's a real odd couple thing and he is played by Shia LaBeouf oh yeah and so it's almost like a sort of a um odyssey kind of because Zach wants to get to um, a wrestling school because he's obsessed with pro wrestling and looking for him from the um, uh, residential facility is Dakota Johnson who is his friend and very concerned about him. So it becomes a kind of a buddy road movie. It is terrific. I okay. really, really enjoyed it. And, um, yeah, I think it was Nice the, family film. Yeah, I mean, look, there's the odd swear. And in my house now everybody's pretty okay with swears except with Kate, for Kate who goes, oh! <laughs> so there's a, a few oohs. But, like, um, yeah. Not it's, too bad. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a great movie. I really enjoyed it. Now Just you, checking what year it was made. 
2019. So, yeah. Now, you are uh, heading down to Melbourne for the Comedy Festival. I am. So, look, um, you know that that show that I did after I just turned 50, the 50-odd years of Crab, which was basically a dare to myself (laughs) and an excuse to go to the Adelaide Fringe, I have reprised it in Sydney and then people started asking, like, what about, you know, so I'm going for um, the Melbourne Comedy Festival, which um, uh, will... will be a real first because, as you know, I'm not a comedian but I do have an hour-long show. But you're funny for a journalist. I'm funny for a journalist (laughs) and I tell embarrassing stories about myself um, for uh, about an hour or 50. Um, But I'm also, now that I've done that once and it was actually fun and interesting, I am currently writing, finishing actually because it's happening in two weeks, um, another show for the Adelaide Fringe And it's called The Grilling Season. (laughs) Um, And it is about, essentially, um, all the strange and funny things that have happened over my years of cooking for and with and eating and, I'm afraid, drinking with politicians in the process of trying to make them tell me things. Um, Also includes a bit of embarrassment for me, um, but also uh, just the weird things that can happen uh, if you're in a room with a politician and an onion, basically. Reminds me that ABC's big political docuseries oh, yeah. uh, about the coalition's years in power will be on iView by the time this episode drops. Nemesis, it's called. So Ep look one it up. is the Abbott years. Ep two is the Turn. Turnbull years. Ep three, the Morrison years. Get yeah. amongst it. <laughs> and see you next time for Sales' oh, Summer of Culture. Wow, you really are wrapping me up. Okay, yep, it's over. <laughs> Jeez. Sorry, I'm trying to protect I always think there's more time. And I know, (laughs) even when you're protecting me. Thank you. Thank you for enjoying both the oral and the visual experience of me talking to this lady here. Uh, Subscribe to our YouTube channel for so much more content. It'll probably quell your enthusiasm. But give us a go or listen on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Did you ever think that we'd be telling people to subscribe to our content? No, I did not. We're cool at last. Don't you're making me look bad in front of my children again.